Our guest of honor is an Egyptian American and an international speaker and author. Two of her books, Reclaim Your Heart and Love and Happiness, are her most famous. She is the, most, uh, she is the first female instructor at Al Maghrib Institute. I would like to welcome to the stage Ustada Yasmin Mugahid. Assalamu alaikum. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbi ajma'in. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul uqtata min lisani yafqahu qawli. It's an honor to be here with you today. I've never been to Arkansas before. Uh, and so far I've uh, witnessed so much hospitality. Uh, and, and, and I actually, this is one of the reasons I, I really like the South, and I recently moved to the South, sort of um, North Carolina, uh, from California, because I love the, the Southern hospitality and the, the way that the community is very welcoming. My topic today is um, about the prosperous future of Muslim millennials. And um, I was thinking a lot about how to approach this topic. And I also wanted to include the concept of education because we are here supporting an educational institution, uh, an Islamic educational institution. And so I was thinking about how is it that I want to approach this topic. And what I decided was I wanted to talk about what actually is the true or one of the main goals of Islamic education. Because we're, we're here supporting a school, we're here talking about uh, this particular school and why Islamic education is so important. So I wanted to just reflect on what is one of the essential goals of Islamic education. And I came up with two, and it's not only these two, but I came up with two. And the first one is that the purpose of Islamic education, or the goal of Islamic education, and this is also a litmus test to let us know if we've succeeded, I believe. And that is to give us a greater purpose. See, one of the things that all people at some point in their life ask is, what am I doing here? What's my purpose? Why am I here? And there's a lot of different answers to this question. But what is that greater purpose? Now, if we look at the Quran and we look at what is it that Allah says, what is it that God gives us as our highest purpose? Now, each and every one of you have a purpose. I'll call this the, the lowercase p purpose, right? We all have purposes that we live for in life, right? We have a lot of doctors, I heard, yeah? We have teachers, we have lawyers, we have mothers, fathers. There's a lot of different roles that we play. But that's not what I'm asking just for a moment. I'm asking what is the purpose, capital P? Why am I actually here? And to answer this question, actually, God is very clear in the Quran. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has actually given us the answer to this question very clearly in the Quran. I'm going to stop for a second. Um, in the Quran, and actually the, the comedian that came before me gave a little bit of an introduction with la 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 um, But this construction of la ilaha illallah, it's a, it's a construction in Arabic where it begins with a negation. In other words, you negate um, any other purpose. So you're, it's almost like taking a slate and wiping it clean. All right. So, for example, la ilaha illallah, linguistically, is actually saying there is no ilah, there is no object of worship, or as, as the brother said, God, small letter G. There is none. So you begin with a negation, and so you have a clean slate. Why does this construction, why is this construction used? The reason is to give exclusivity. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? So that you say there is no other purpose or there is no other God in order to say illa and then you add except. Now what that does in the Arabic language is it tells you that this is the exclusive answer to the question. So in this case, la ilaha illallah is that there's nothing worthy of worship. And if you stop there, that's atheism, isn't it? Right? There's no God. La ilaha, the first half is atheism. There's no ilah. There's no God. But 
Islam is to add the second half, which is very important, illallah, except for God. So in other words, there is nothing worthy of being my object of worship. And ilah in the Arabic language is a very deep concept, by the way. Ilah isn't just something you pray to. Ilah isn't just like a stone idol. And ilah, and, and I'm going I'm to tell you this, even an atheist has an ilah. You're going to be like, what? Even an atheist has an ilah. Even an agnostic has an ilah. Even someone who says, I don't believe in God, has an ilah. Meaning, they have something that they worship. Something that they put at the center of their existence. Something that they put at the center of their hearts. Something they put at the center of their lives. Something they live for. And something they're willing to die for. That's an ilah. And so, what makes a Muslim is to say that there's nothing worthy of being at that position except for God. It is pure monotheism. Pure in Arabic, tawheed. So that's la ilaha illallah. But now where does the other ayah come in? Wa ma khalaqtu al-jinna wal-ins. This is the ayah about purpose. Capital P. Again, each and every one of us have lesser purposes, but this is ultimate purpose. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we have not created jinn and human beings for any other purpose in parentheses. Wa ma khalaqtu al-jinna wal-ins. We have not created them for any other purpose, illa, again, you hear that illa, except, so this is that exclusivity of purpose. Illa li'abudun. Except, now, here's another very deep concept, ubudiyya. The concept of ubudiyya, which means, loosely translated, worship. But, the concept of ubudiyya in Islam is not just praying and fasting. Worship is not just what you do in the mosque. But worship can also be time that you spend with your family. Worship can also be time that you give to your community. Worship can be teaching. Worship can be even, even that, that intimacy between a husband and wife is actually an act of worship, as the Prophet ﷺ said. So worship is very, com it's, a, it's a comprehensive concept in Islam. But what is God telling us? He's telling us that the only purpose that we were created for, and there's no other, is to worship God. Now, what does it mean to truly worship God? It means essentially to put Allah or God. You know, one of the funny things is, I remember like a long time ago, there was like this award ceremony, and this celebrity stands up and was like being, trying to be really like open and inclusive, so he goes, um, whether you believe in God or Allah, that's the point, is they think it's two different things. God is Allah. When we say, when we say, la ilaha illallah, we're not saying that our God is the only God or our Muslim God. We're saying the God of all people is the only thing worthy of our ultimate love and worship. And so when we give purpose to the next generation, see, because the problem is we live in a society right now that worships a lot of other things. We worship a lot of things in our society. And in fact, we are bombarded with things to worship. And I'm not talking here about Jesus. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about materialism. I'm telling you that we are actually living in a society that teaches us and and it actually bombards us with the worship of money, with the worship of status, with the worship of power. These are the things we actually worship. We don't worship, uh, you know, these religious symbols anymore. This is actually what, what our children are, and us, are dealing with. That this is the type of worship that we're being told to, 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 in, you know, to be involved in. And that is that take your money as your Lord, or take your status as your Lord, or take power. There are a lot of people who worship power. If you look at the crimes that are being committed at the highest level to the lowest level in the world, and you look at why, you'll find that that's what it's about. It's about the worship of power and the worship of money. And so these are objects of worship. Now, how do we come back to our ultimate purpose? Our ultimate purpose is to realize that our, 
that, that our being created was for this one purpose, and that is to know, love, worship God. And I think that this is the first goal that I see, and as a litmus test, are we doing our job right in Islamic education? Have we given that higher purpose? It isn't only about learning haram and halal. See, the problem is, I think, that a lot of Islamic education uh, across the board kind of goes wrong in this department. Is that we tend, when we come to Islamic studies, we tend to teach Islam as a list of harams and halals, right? As a list of do's and don'ts. It's haram to eat this, it's halal to eat this, it's haram to wear this, and it's halal to, eat, to wear this. And that's sort of what Islam becomes boiled down to. And that's a big problem because ultimately we have to be able to teach our children a higher purpose, to, to give them perspective. What are they doing here? And then how are they going to be able to live in this materialistic society without worshiping materialism? without worshiping that money. Yes, be doctors, yes, be lawyers, yes, be teachers, be, have, your, have your endeavors in this life, but be careful not to worship it. Because the moment that you worship it, that's when you drown in it. You know, there's this really beautiful analogy. I write about it in, um, in my book, Reclaim Your Heart. There's a really beautiful analogy that one of the scholars gave about dunya. Now, what is dunya? And this brings me to my second point of one of the goals of Islamic education. And I think that one of the goals of Islamic education needs to be giving children the tools to master the dunya. To master the dunya. How many people have seen The Matrix? Like two people? Okay, anyway. Basically, mastering the dunya is realizing that this life, knowing it for what it is, and not allowing it to own you. This is very important. And so the analogy that he gives is that this life is like an ocean. Now if you think about an ocean, what's the purpose of an ocean? Well, if you think if you're traveling on the ocean, what are you gonna use to travel on the ocean? A boat. Great, okay, you guys are awake, right? You use a boat, right? So you use a boat to get to travel from point A to point B on an ocean. So he gives the analogy that this life, dunya, is like an ocean. Now the thing about an ocean is it's really beautiful from the shore, right? We can appreciate an ocean. It's really beautiful from the boat, right? Yes? But what happens when you allow the ocean to enter the boat? Anyone heard of the Titanic? It sinks, brilliant. So what he explains is that the believer, or the human being in fact, in this life is like a person, is like a boat in the ocean. And the boat is like the heart. So the heart in, the, in, in this life is like that boat in the ocean. The problem is, as long as you keep the water outside of the boat, it stays afloat. You feel me? You will be able to survive the ocean and even use the ocean, right? We, we get food from the ocean. We use the ocean for travel. But the ocean can also swallow you up, can it? If you allow the ocean to enter your boat, in this analogy, it's the heart. If you allow the ocean to enter the boat, that's when it owns the boat and that's when it breaks the boat and that's when it can consume the boat and drown the boat. And this is what happens to a human being who allows this life, dunya, materialism, to enter their hearts and take over. So the problem is not having things in the dunya. The problem isn't having money. The problem isn't having power. The problem isn't having status. The problem is when we start to worship these things. The problem is when these things take over our hearts. And when a person allows money, for example, to take over their hearts, it's like a boat that allows the ocean water to enter it. And we all know, as many of you said, what happened to the Titanic, right? It was supposed to be the unsinkable ship. It was supposed to be the greatest ship of its, of its kind, of its time, right? And what happened to it? It went down in history as the ship that got owned by the ocean 
and, and, and drowned. And that's exactly what happens to us when we don't have the right relationship with dunya. When we allow the dunya to enter our hearts and take over. And when we lo our love for dunya is so intense that we actually become slaves to the dunya. So there's a very famous saying of one of the companions. And what he said is, zuhud. Zuhud is a concept of, of detachment, not being too attached to this life. He said that detachment is not that you do not own anything. It is that nothing owns you. So you may, and there were many companions, they were very wealthy. They had money, but as the scholars say, their money was in their hand, not in their hearts. The problem is when money is in the heart, it poisons the heart, just like the water of the ocean poisons the ship. And so these are concepts that we have to teach our children because, yes, we live in a society that tells us to worship money, that tells us to worship status, to worship materialism. Now, I want to leave you with an ayah, really powerful ayah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Hadid, and this is verse 20, Allah gives us a very, very powerful analogy of what this life is. And I want you guys to pay attention to this because it actually, if you look at this ayah, it's really amazing. If you look at this ayah, it's, um, it's sort of like a chronology of human life on this earth in one ayah. اعلموا أنما الحياة الدنيا لعب So first Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, know that the life of this world is play. Now I'll tell you from experience, and I'm sure many of you who've had children, what is the most important thing to a child? So a human being who first enters this life, what is the most important thing to that, to that human being? Play. play, thank you. Play, right? You want to get a gift for a child? They're not going to appreciate an Armani suit. They're not going to care, right? But if you get them a toy, they'll appreciate it. You could spend 99 cents on a toy, and they'll appreciate it more than a $1,000 suit. Am I right? Because for a child, the most important thing is laib. Laibun is play. Then when a child gets a little older, what becomes important? So I'm talking now middle school age. Any teachers of middle school or parents of middle school age children? Raise your hand. All right. Can anyone tell me what's the most common phrase that comes out of their mouth? Anyone? I'm bored. There it is. Everyone always gets it. It's I'm bored. And the reason for this is at that age, you want to be entertained. It's like they want constant stimulation. You know what I'm saying? They're not playing with rattles anymore, but now it's the video games. I want constant stimulation, right? And now we have Netflix, right? So it's like constant. They're phones. You can't, they can't sit for one moment without being stimulated. And it's that concept of I want amusement. You know what that's called in the Quran? Lahu. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, la'ibun wa lahu. Right after play, Allah says lahu. And lahu means amusement, entertainment. So Allah here is saying no, that the life of this world, first he says play. Then he says amusement or entertainment. La'ibun wa lahun wa zinatun. Now we get into high school, all right? What happens in high school? Well, what happens in high school is you're not playing with rattles anymore. Maybe you may or may not still be obsessed with video games. That's, that's a <laughs> point of contention. But what becomes very important when you're a teenager, especially for girls, is how you look. It becomes more and more important how you appear. And this is why if you look statistically at when do you see a lot of eating disorders, it's usually during the adolescent age. And that is because the way you look becomes of utmost importance. So what does Allah say next in this ayah? La'ibun wa lahun wa zina. Zina is adornment. To decorate, to adorn. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this number three in this ayah. Now as you get older and now you're getting into college and you're taking the MCATs and the LSATs and the SATs and the ACTs and it's a lot about uh, proving yourself, isn't it? So what does Allah say next? 
Next, he says that the life of this world is a lot of showing off. It's boasting. It's like, yeah, uh, what, what was your score? You know what I got? Or you know what school I got into? What school did you get into? Or our parents like to, you know, tafakhrum baynakum. This is the showing off. And now, alhamdulillah, we have um, a platform for it called social media, right? It's a platform for tafakhrum baynakum. It's showing off boasting between one another, right? We have any kind of accomplishment that we have in our, um, in our lives or in our children's lives, we have to put it up on social media. Why? Well, so that everybody can see that, hey, I have this accomplishment, how about you? And there's a lot of comparisons. Yes or no? Come on, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Boasting between one another. Allah is saying this in the Quran. Tafakhrum baynakum. This showing off between one another. What? تَفَاخُرٌ بَيْنَكُمْ وَتَكَاثُرٌ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ And then Allah says, finally, and then this like, this like competition sort of gaining in money, in wealth, and children. Look at the timeline. What happens after you graduate, and then you get a job, and you get married, and you settle down, and then you have children? Is now your focus is, let me make more money, and it's about your children. So now, what are we focused on? We're focused on how are we now gonna compete with our kids, right? <laughs> right? How are we gonna compete with our kids? Well, your cousin, you know, so there's a, that competition now with money and children. And, and you know, what kind of house you have, what kind of car do you drive? This is the nature of dunya, right? This is what Allah is saying. And he says it in chronological order. But you know what's, what we have to like, reflect on about this ayah? Is that the things that matter most to you at any point in time, right? We said play first, right? At, there was a time in your life where all you cared about was a rattle. And you thought the rattle was the end of the world. What happens if you take a rattle away from a baby? Anyone? The end of the world. So for that human being, it's the end of the world to take away a rattle. What happens if you keep a, a, a middle schooler from playing his video games or her video games? It's the end of the world, you feel me? What happens when you get older and you know you're just, you, have, you have a breakout or something, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? Or what happens when you get a bad grade at some point in your life? Every single one of you probably thought at one point the world was over because you got a bad grade. You all, it all happened. It happened to someone. But now five years, 10 years, 20 years, 40 years later, does it matter anymore? Does it matter anymore, anyone? That exam, it actually didn't end your life, right? Losing that rattle, losing that video game, it actually didn't end your life. That breakout, it didn't end your life. Even that breakup, it didn't end your life, right? And so the idea is, and this is what Allah is teaching us, is that these things, and I'm going to tell you in a moment, the rest of the ayah explains it. These things, we believe, we believe it's like everything, but then it passes, it fades, right? And then five years later, ten years later, it doesn't even matter anymore. Then Allah says, it's like a farmer who gets really excited with this heavy rain. Why? Because of the nabat that comes from it. Because of the vegetation that will come from heavy rain. But then Allah says, what happens to that vegetation? But that same vegetation eventually dries up and becomes yellow. And then you see it? That... That same vegetation, it'll dry up, it'll become yellow, and then it just becomes like debris. You know, if you take, like, if you take a rose, and it's really beautiful for a moment, a day, two, maybe if you're lucky, a week, but what happens after a month to that rose? No one's ever seen a rose? It dries up, thank you. It dries up, it becomes brown, yellow, brown, and then what would happen if you crumble it in the wind? It just becomes debris. It just goes, it becomes nothing. It used to be a beautiful rose, right? This is a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what Allah is telling us is that this metaphor that he's giving us 
is the metaphor of what this life is, of what dunya is. It's something that we get very worked up about for a while, and then it passes, right? And then we get worked up about something else, and then it passes. And then we get worked up, and then it passes. Until eventually, the whole thing passes. Until the whole thing passes. And this is what Allah is telling us. And it just becomes like debris. And then Allah says, And then Allah is saying that in the akhirah, in the hereafter, there's basically one of two outcomes. Either there is punishment or there is maghfirah, forgiveness and mercy from God. And what is the life of this world but chattel of deception. What is the point of this ayah? What is the lesson behind this ayah? The lesson is this. There are things in this life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us. Mata'a, by the way, the word mata'a. In the Arabic language, mata'a, it's translated as pleasure. But literally, it can also mean a tool. A tool. Just like the ocean is a tool, right? It's not about hating dunya. It's about using dunya. Does that make sense? It's about using it. Because every single thing in dunya, yes, you can enjoy it, but essentially it's meant to take you to a better place. And actually, if you look at the meaning of the word dunya, does anyone know what the, what's the literal meaning? Something lower. So hayat dunya literally means the lower life. Isn't that deep? Anyone think that's deep? Yeah. That's deep. Yes. The lower life. And you see, even in the Quran, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about in Surah Al-Rum, He says, Adna al-Ard. He says, Adna al-Ard means the lowest land. Ghulibat al-Rum fi Adna al-Ard. When Allah was actually describing something that was going to happen in the future, He was saying and describing as it was going to happen, and He said when it was going to happen, and He said in the lowest land. Adna al-Ard. The word dunya means lower. And it is hayat al-dunya because, guess what? We have a higher life. We have a better life. And this particular one is the lower life. It's not all bad, but it's not all good either. Do you feel me? It's not all bad, but it's not all good either. It's not perfect. Anyone have a perfect life? Raise your hand. Anyone have a perfect life? Guess what? No one has a perfect life. No matter how much money you have, no matter how much power, just look at Trump, right? No matter what you have of dunya, it will never be perfect. And that is the nature of dunya. And yet, the human being is a little foolish. Right? Can I tell you why? بَلْ تُؤْثِرُونَ الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ وَأَبْقَى That we still prefer this life, even though the next life is better and longer lasting. أقولي قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم إنه غفور رحيم سبحانك الله وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك I don't want to keep you too long because it's late but I want to say this um, uh, everything I've said is a reminder to myself first and I also want to let you know I do have a, a few limited copies of I have two books uh, one of them is called Reclaim Your Heart. I'll just tell you a little bit about it. Um, and the other one is called Love and Happiness. Reclaim Your Heart is a book I wrote uh, literally through blood, sweat, and tears, my own life. Um, as I went through my life, I, I learned a couple things. I made a lot of mistakes. Uh, and so I wrote about it. I wrote about the things that I was going through, and I wrote about, about what I was learning along the way. And essentially, the concept of Reclaim Your Heart is about the fact that we come into this life and we give our hearts away. We give our hearts away a lot of things. We give our hearts away to mother, money. We give our hearts away to people. We give our hearts away to you know, our careers. There's a lot of things that we give our hearts to that don't deserve to have our hearts. Um, essentially, the concept is that the heart belongs to God. And so it's about how to take your heart back and give it to God. And what does that actually mean? And, it, and the fact that it doesn't mean you become a monk, it doesn't mean you don't get married and have kids, it doesn't mean you don't have a career, you know, I have, I have all those things, alhamdulillah. But it was about my own journey of understanding how to live in this life without drowning in it, right? That concept of the dunya. And then Love and Happiness also, um, it, it, was, it was a book I wrote um, as I was in a different stage of my life and about the fact that there are difficulties in life, but there's also a lot of beauty in life. Um, and the fact that dunya is really, it's a little bit of everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
inna ma'al usri yusra. And this is a very deep concept because Allah doesn't say in this ayah, if I ask most people to translate this ayah, inna ma'al usri yusra, most people will say after hardship is ease. Most people. But in this ayah, Allah doesn't say ba'd. In another ayah, yes. In this ayah, Allah says ma'a. The word ma'a in Arabic means with, along with. And that's a very important concept. Because sometimes we think, okay, I'm going through a hardship. And right now it's all dark. I'm going through a difficulty. And right now it's all bad. That's actually incorrect. It's never all dark. And it's never all bad at any point in time. Ever. Nobody has it all dark and nobody has it all bad because Allah says that with the hardship is ease, plural, by the way. So, usr is singular. So, one single hardship that you have is accompanied with many eases or blessings. What it means is that at every point in time, no matter how hard your life gets, Allah at the same time gives you a lot of blessings. And it's always at the same time. I'm so amazed at how many times, and you guys will probably notice this in life too, how many times I've heard about people who have a very happy occasion in their life. They just got married. They just had a child. And at almost at the same time, someone they love dies. Anyone? Almost at the same time. I've heard this over and over and over. And a lot of people might look at that and say, why did that, why did that have to ruin it? Right? I just, you know what, I, I just got married, why, why did my father have to die? Or, or why did my sister have to, you know, they feel that it ruined it. I know someone just had twins, two weeks later their mother dies. Why did it have to ruin it? But you know what, that's not what Allah's saying. Allah's telling us, inna ma'al usri yusra. Let me show you a different way to look at it. With the hardship is the eases, plural. Meaning that Allah gave you those children. Allah gave you that spouse in order to help you cope with the hardship that was written for you. Does that make sense? Yes. And it's a completely different way of looking at it. But this is what Allah is saying. He's saying that with the hardship is ease and it's plural. So Allah is actually giving us blessings at the same time as our hardships to make it easier for us, out of his rahmah, out of his mercy. So this is what I write about, and um, inshallah, it's gonna just, we're going to have them available outside. I also wanted to make another announcement, and I feel that this is very important as, a, as, as an issue that we're dealing with in our community. We're going through difficulties. Everyone has their personal difficulties. People have, you know, we have collective communal difficulties. And a lot of us, we have an issue in our community, especially in the Muslim community, is we don't know how to ask for help. And there is a sort of a taboo about asking for help. When you're having trouble in your marriage, for example, there is a taboo of going and getting counseling. When you're having trouble, when you're, have, when you're suffering, you know, personally, there's a taboo about going and getting a therapist. And I think it's very, very important that we realize that we have to remove this taboo. And we have to seek help, and I'll tell you why. Because Islamically, the Prophet ﷺ told us, tie your camel and put your trust in Allah. This is a concept in our deen, which means that we are supposed to seek help or we're supposed to make an effort, that's the tying the camel. The whole story goes like this. There was a companion, he wasn't tying his camel, so then the Prophet ﷺ asked him, why is he not tying his camel? He said, because I have my trust in God. So the Prophet ﷺ taught him this timeless lesson. Tie your camel and put your trust in God at the same time. Doing your effort is part of worship. This is very important. When you're sick, going to the doctor can be an act of worship. When you're sick, going to the doctor can be an act of worship. As long as you know that the true one who heals is God. But we have tools in this life. Doctors are a tool. Therapists are a tool. Counselors are a tool. So I just wanted to mention that um, because both me and my husband, we are very passionate about this area. And my husband provides coaching for couples and also for individual men because this is a place 
where honestly, there is a vacuum. And especially I found, you know, and, and he's found, there's a trend in our community, and I'm just gonna be honest with you for a second, especially men do not ask for help. And they don't ask for help until it's too late sometimes. Whether they are suffering themselves with depression or, or, or there's a lot of um, issues, for example, with addiction, pornography, different things like that. Um, but also within the marriages. My husband's always getting messages. I, am, I have a problem in my marriage. Okay, sister, can we get, you know, can we have some couples counseling, some coaching? Yeah, but my husband doesn't want it. And this is a trend, is that there is an issue where the sisters want and the men don't. And, 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 and part of what we have to do is remove that taboo, remove that, that barrier that we have that it's not okay to ask for help. Because honestly, this is something in our religion, is to ask for help. And when the Prophet Sallallahu said, if you see something wrong, try to fix it. Try to fix it with your hand, and if you cannot, with your tongue. And if you cannot, then at least hate it in your heart, and this is the weakest of faith. We're supposed to be a people who take action in trying to solve our problems. Aquli qawli hadha wa astaghfir Allah li wa lakum inna ghafurun rahim subhanakallahu wa bihamdak ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik inshallah i will have a table right outside the door um, if you're interested in in signing up for coaching or couples coaching or whether it's individual and also my books will be available jazakumullahu khairan wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh